Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's currently Sunday, October 9th, 2011, and this is Day 9 Daily 358, part number 2, where we are looking at a game between two Korean players. One of them I can read, it is Seed SG, and the other one is just a bunch of Korean characters. But this is one of these, like, intermediarily interesting games where the play kind of, in, in, like, the fundamentals are there, like macro and pro building and general checking of the mini-map, but, like, the strategic decisions, like, are woundful. And the whole purpose of this daily is, again, to look at this weird play to talk about kind of what should happen, why some of these moves are really brilliant and we like them, but then also to criticize how easy it is to misplay in this spot. And though it might create an interesting game, that doesn't mean it's good play. Because, yes, we love good play. Because it makes for great tournament and viewing experiences. But this is from the view of players. From a player's perspective, from Tron trying to be the best of the best of the best, you should probably not like this game so much. So I thought this was an overly bold move as our Zergi player. Well, we just... I'm pretty sure we know units are here, but we're going to go ahead and expand here anyways. Um... If you're trying to go for the most spread out expanse possible, yes, obviously this main is kind of where you want to go to. And what blows my mind is that this literally is effectively the same as this base, and there's nothing wrong with retaking this base. We're not trying to surprise our opponent by taking this base. We're trying to spread out. We want it far away from him. We want it far away from him. That's why we're taking these two corner bases. And of course, as the Zealots continue to warp in, it becomes increasingly tough. So we're going to see our Zerg player continue to make Mutalisks spreading all around the map. If you're going to keep making Mutalisks, get the upgrades for the Mutalisks. We see these sorts of cool counterattacks uh, trying to go on, but he can't quite manage to take it down. As a Zerg player doing this strategy, you should absolutely be favoring gas as much as possible. And this sort of engagement is exactly what you want. Where the Protoss player is saying to himself, Oh gosh, I really gotta kill that off. Oh gosh, I really gotta stay at home and defend against these Mutalisks. Let's actually rewind to around this time, just 30 seconds prior. You see all these Phoenixes here. You see this. One cannon, two cannon, three cannon. This is about five Zealots worth of money that your Protoss player cannot make to try to do damage to you. Um... And all these phoenixes stay back at home because you have the counter-attack advantage. You're always threatening uh, doing a huge mutilisk counter-attack. There are the mutilisks. You're always threatening this. So what you want to try to force are engagements like the one that we will see coming up right up here. Where the phoenixes move forward. Oh no, the zealots come out. And the Protoss player is scared to actually move out with an entire uh, the entirety of his force because he wants to try to pull back. Look at how many cannons he's built. This is a clear win from the Zerg angle, this move here. So now we see Seed SG also doing something that's... I, I, this ordinarily would suck. Ordinarily this would be terrible. But notice that this is actually genius move by him. Why would this ordinarily be it? Um... Why would this ordinarily be it? Let me rephrase that. Why would this ordinarily suck? Well, I mean, you have half your army there and half your army back in the main. You kind of have to be able to pull back. In fact, if you watch a lot of the recent PVZs on this map, we'll see Protosses who are able to execute big pushes, kill off third bases, but they can't get that army back home. The Zerg accumulates enough Roach Ling and kills it off. However, this can obviously defend itself, he can force field and just protect the ramp, no problem. But he has this mothership, so he can recall back home at any point in time that he wants. But the problem is that Zerg has these mutilists up and can force these engagements. And why is he not recalled right now? Uh, I'm a little concerned that Zerg just hasn't taken this mutiling force and killed that off. You saw how Zerg was able to kill off this small amount of forces? Yeah, that's the point of mutilist Zergling. You are counterattacking. You are trying to isolate small amounts of units like this, pick them off, get free kills whenever there is a slightly negative engagement for you, or even a not that positive engagement for you. You run away. So this is a good engagement for you, so go kill it off. Uh-oh, uh-oh, no, 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 stop. Stop messaging me. Crap, I'm getting called by my friends who are locked outside my house right now. Do you hear that buzzing? Those are my friends. I actually have to let them in. I have to. I'm so sorry. They'll be locked out.
I forgot I have roommates that can do it. Ha! I don't need to go all the way. Don't destroy my room on the way back in. All right, cool. I have friends staying at my house lately. Woo! All right. So we have CDSG just being terrible. <laughs> Trying to move down his ramp. It's all right. It's, it is okay. It is okay. But now here's going to be a really fancy schmancy move that is just exciting to see. This is actually kind of a stroke of brilliance. Here it comes. Oh no, the isolated force gets recalled over to the main. And why is this so clever? Because it circumvents this big damn thing, right? It actually hits the heart of Zergy base. Now we're going to see some weirdish decisions by our uh, Zerg player. Uh, in particular, building his spawning pool and spire up here. He actually has a spire totally alive and well right there. His pool is not really under any threat. So he's going to kill all this off. And he's just going to let these two finish. And hey, you know what? Seed SG. Again, the idea, I think, was there. The whole reason the counterattack works is this huge wall. If we get a mothership, we can recall an army up here. We can have it be protected by this huge number of phoenixes that we have. And then we can decimate his base while still just controlling this small ramp. And then when he tries to defend it, or even tries to go for a counterattack, we have these sorts of options here. This is cool. Very cool. Now, Seed chooses um, not a great spot to try to take for an expansion. I actually kind of prefer this one a little bit more. Um, but both are sort of equally difficult. Now, by the way, there's a huge swell of Archons that Seed did. He was getting really high on gas because all he was doing was making Zealots for these counterattacks. And it's interesting to note that if you're against a Ling uh, Mutalisk force and you're making a lot of Phoenixes and, a, and you know the Mothership and largely Zealots for the counterattack, that actually ends up working out pretty cool. You can do this transition into Archons. But for God's sake, use a Forge. Oh my... Oh my... Oh my God! Why are you not upgrading at the Forge? Right? Like, see... Again, brilliant move to do the recall into the main. Brilliant move to do the counterattacks up here. Successful, weak pull into the main. Weak transition into Das Archons. Into Das Archons. Yeah. So see that see this overseer here that just gets absolutely bear mauled. And see this? Oh, you see that? This is kind of fun. This is fun. Watch this. Yeah, here come the Mutas! Oh no! That's not what you want to have happen to Mutas! That's pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool. That's, that's kind of cool. But everything up to that point... It's been terrible. Right? Like, let's actually watch that again, because this has been the interesting part of the game so far. Right? This is what I like to call a, 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 a nugget of truth, right? A, a, it's, a, it's like there's bits of truth there. The idea of having Archons in a Vortex is really good against a player who's going Mutalisk, right? It It's good. And I can now, from watching this game, perceive a way to get here. I, I expand, I transition to air, and I use largely Zealots and counterattacking myself in order to deal with his Mutaling. It's kind of very specifically dealing with Mutalisk Zergling. Um, but, you know, get, get your upgrades. If you imagine upgrades being here, if you imagine this drop, this recall with the Mothership being bigger, if you imagine this group of forces having been pulled back properly early on, a lot of good things happen. And even with all these terrible things happen, we still have the delightful, glorious moment of all the Mutalists eating it hard. A lot of units lost. Many, many units death deading. So, this is pretty cool. Now, Zerg re-expands here. You know, it's okay to abandon the strategy at some point. It's okay. I mean, like, at this point in time in the gameplay, it's probably better to expand here. Considering he has an army right there, it's like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to counterattack him. That's great if that's the logic you're going for. 
but if you're flying directly, I mean, less the fact that he flew straight into these units, and more the fact that he's actually nearby his opponent's army. That's what really bothers me. Now, something kind of amazing happens here. Something kind of amazing happened. Zerg loses this whole army and says, well, God, I better I better build more Mutalisks. All right, I got I to gotta hurry up and build Mutalisks. Man, I have, like, nothing. I better expand and make sure I have enough Mutalisks. That's actually correct. That is actually a correct decision. What many people will say right now is they'll be like, but, whoa, he has Archons and Phoenixes and he has a mothership. Why on earth would we go Mutaling now? Now, there's a difference between having, like, Roach Hydra ready to combat that army. That's, re that's, that's great. But getting it, look at the position. How hard is it to get Roach Hydra? Well, I'd have to build the Roach Warren. How long does that take to build? Well, it would take me 55 seconds. God, that's a whole minute where I'm completely vulnerable. And then what do I do? Well, I have to build Roaches, which take about 30 seconds each. And, you know, I need a lot of larva to be able to do that. Do I have any upgrades for Roaches? Well, no, I don't. And then I actually have to get the speed upgrade Roaches, which takes a long time as well. It's... It's easier, actually, to get out this weak army. Where are the mutalists that we do have? It's, it's easier and better to get out this weak army than it is to try to make the transition. If you, say, maybe made a roach war now and just started to get the speed upgrade but didn't make any roaches, you'd be setting yourself up to transition, and I would like that a little bit more. So, at this point in time, with the Protoss expanding up here and building all his cannons up here and the Zerg allowing this to finish up here with his spawning pool number two uh, and his spire number two. Uh, again, good basic ideas, but like totally missed time. And could have easily canceled both of them. And we see CDSG doing El, El Damage. And now we're going to see some, some really nice play from our Zergy player. Amazingly, we're gonna see him do some really nice play. And see, look, he's expanding up here now. Yeah, there, there you go. And look, sending the drone before building the hatch. Yes, money, big money, bam, pow, boom. And he's not gonna just be using Mutalus. He's gonna be using Zerglings at this point in time. Now, our our, our Protoss player is is uh, doing, I think, a clear mistake. He has twelve Archons. Do you really need the thirteenth Archon? Like. Do you, do you really? Like, for instance, if I have four Archons, and I level that up to eight, or actually even something simpler, like five or six, yeah, you know what? That's actually going to this is gonna help. That's going to be pretty good. I like that quite a bit. Sorry, the garlic is just so strong in this room, I can't believe it. I cannot believe how much garlic they're cutting. That makes sense to, like, you know, if you have 12 Stalkers, you get up to 16 Stalkers, it's, yeah, great, right? But when we're like... You know, I need another Archon. This is so excessive. This is like getting an explosive, like a highly explosive grenade and putting spikes on it. You know, you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, it's like a nail file that's that's like a foot and a half long. You just, you don't need the foot and a half like... It's like it's a nail file, not a string instrument. It's totally, it would be better to have two Templar with Storm right our idea is here with our archon toilet strategy to be honest it is straight up just going for the toilet and now that, now that our opponent is low on phoenixes hey you know what this strat is actually going to be pretty good again our counterattack heavy archons have pretty poor range and yeah you know what he's going to try to go for here but look at this our counterattack strategy but reattuned for this other base and, and he doesn't build a, a spore crawler to detect the invisible units that are going to end up killing this entire this entire base. Yeah, you know, you see the, see these ripples? These are actually Archon ripples. These are uh, Archon ripples, as a matter of fact. Wait, is there an Overseer? Did he really miss the Overseer with the Vortex? Oh, there are two Overseers. Money! Money, cash, Overseers! Pose! Yeah, look at that. Moving that down, and then all of a sudden... <laughs> mega overseas. But yeah, it didn't end up working out so well. So that's pretty fun. So that's pretty cool. And we see Seed SG having this base up here. Takes out an Archon. Some very nice control. We'll simply walk to the other side to kill it off. 
You'll notice that if all these cannons were just sort of pulled back slightly, it would be a totally adequate defense and it would be a really hard to crack base. But now we have the base that is totally cracked. And Zerg's going to do some amazingness here with these Mutalisks. Some I actually quite enjoyed this uh, a bit. Yeah, look at this. Moving up with the Zerglings, just target firing everything that shoots up, and boom! This is exactly how this style works. This is so awesome. I don't care that you're going Archon Mothership with Vortex. This is this is beautiful control and play by Zerg. This is really quite, quite smart. Uh, still would like to see an upgrade here. And see, this is the makings of, like, a good game. I mean, in the Army tab, we see that they're kind of equal. In the Units of Lost tab, we see that Zerg is just getting kind of bear mauled. The Mothership is just kind of hanging out. Oh, I'm sorry, I come back. But this is the sort of game that has some juiciness to it, but that just physically, it like it hurts me to watch this happen. It, I act, I, I, I see it, and I'm just like, ah, because let me show you, like, the most painful thing of all. 27 minute mark. Zero, zero, one upgrades. And I even chrono boosted plus one ground attack as well. Oh, I just can't. No, no. So, so it's physically painful to watch, but still, from the most physically painful games that end up being really good, I still think it's so important to look for the bits of truth aspect. So for instance, this kind of big mutalisk play, this kind of big mutalisk play to follow up a player who opened up air, actually seems to be something that's kind of legit, you know, like doing these sorts of defenses, going for the mutalisk ling, uh, you know, maybe doing some slow overlord drops here. In particular, the zergling counterattacks have been really potent. I mean, you imagine, what if he played normal and he actually expanded here? Sure, he can do blink up and down here, but if I move my mutalisks in and he, say, for instance, blinks up, I can swing it with my zerglings and swing it with my mutalisks, hit this expansion, and finally when his blink recharges and he can blink back down, I can always run away. I think creep spread is going to be increasingly important for this type of strategy. Let's actually go ahead and take some questions from Dat Dare Chat Dare. Let me see here. Let's go ahead and take some questions, guys. Let's go ahead and do this. But, you know, so that's from the Zerg end. I talked about this bits of truth thing. From the Protoss end, what I'm seeing is, well, wait a minute. Just going Stargate, then straight for Mothership? has some surprising amount of potency to it. I mean, we probably have to be a little careful with how we pulled it off. But I'm really liking the way that it especially lets us deal with a, a player when we are um, two base versus two base. If I early expanded and went straight for Mothership, I feel like he would be solidly able to deal with it in three base versus three base. Yeah, I kind of just agree with myself there. I just think that that's so smart. Yeah. But let's see here. Let us see here. Here's a question from a crazy monk. Dear Day 9, why do you think it's bad to have a 13th Archon when the opponent is going for such heavy Mutalisk? Or actually, I even think more so like even Mutalisk Zergling even. How many times can Day 9 say even in one sentence? Wouldn't he need more Archons? So, there, it, it's it's... That is a true statement that definitely Archons are an extremely strong unit versus Mutalisks and Zerglings, the two units that our Zerg buddy's making. However, I want you to think about that there must be a limit where the <laughs> where there's basically diminishing marginal utility, to use that economic term, right? Zero Archons to one Archon, that's a big difference. One Archon to two Archon, still a pretty big difference. 50 Archons to 51 Archons, not that much of a gain. In particular, when you think about how do Mutalisks engage my Archons? Well, generally, they're going to try to avoid a giant ball of Archons at all costs. Once you hit, like, eight Archons or so, that feels like a good number, maybe somewhere between six to eight, the Mutalisks are going to run. Three to four Archons? Well, if he had, like, 30 Mutalisks and they were spread out, He'd probably run in and take them down. But if you have, like, say, eight Archons or so, um, getting the ninth one, I mean, the Mutalists are still going to be running away. If you get an engagement, you're still going to win by a long shot. And what I'm just encouraging you to do is whenever you end up having a great number of one type of unit, 
you've got to be careful when adding on more of that kind of unit because you don't get as much of a gain by having it and you have a very limited predictable behavior of army. It, uh, especially when thinking something like, would two High Templar help me here? And the answer is way more than one Archon. If it's something low, again, imagine if you had 10 Zealots and two High Templar and then 10 Zealots and one Archon. Now we're thinking about two different armies that has a real trade-off there. Let's take one more question um, to take uh, before we end up going on a brief break. Yeah. Ah, Rylus says, Dear Day 9, seems to me that your main complaint is that they didn't upgrade. Is it ever a good idea to not have upgrades in the late game, especially if you see your opponent massing units? Uh, I'll rephrase it um, a little bit and say, is it ever a good idea um, to have not started upgrades early for one reason or another? Um, so now I'm in the late game and I don't really have those upgrades. In general, if you are very low econ, like let's say it was two base versus two base, you had some huge clashes, and then you kind of pull back to your respective areas, and your main's mined out, and your nat is running a little dry, but you don't even have a third base yet. Probably don't really want to be investing in some upgrades right at that very moment, but honestly, you kind of need to be getting upgrades at a consistent pace, like really. It's so important. They're so inexpensive in StarCraft 2. In a game like Warcraft 3, they were pretty expensive if you imagined it relative to um, how much a unit costs. But considering that you're going to have 30 Mutalisks and the upgrade is the cost of one Mutalisk, just upgrade it. And weirdly enough, um, I'd probably say if, like, for instance, you have 12 Phoenixes and you're never going to get any, or excuse me, the six Phoenixes and you're never going to get any more, probably it's okay to skip the plus one. If you're going to get 12 Phoenixes, you should probably get the plus one. I would just encourage all of you to kind of be aware of just continuing to churn out the upgrades. And it's more that you should always be getting them. And if you get them really, really early, that's its own sort of interesting situation. But damn it, be getting them. Damn it, please be getting them. They will always help. Because especially now that we're at 130 food versus 130 food... If you have an upgrade, that's literally like 70 to 120 more damage per shot. So we're going to take a break, and I'm going to let you think about that. And then we're going to wrap this sucker up. Whoops. Yeah. There we go. Wrapping up the daily. Coming up in part three. Ooh.